This is the story of a dream made real, a modern day adventure, of stepping outside the box, exploring the unknown and stretching comfort zones. This is the story of determination to succeed, to overcome adversity, of two people united with common purpose. This is the culmination of our six year voyage, full circle around the world. It's 5 a.m. We're approaching the coast of Grenada, having sailed overnight from Tobago. Although it's only a short overnight sail, it's probably the most significant passage of our entire circumnavigation so far. As we approach the coast here, we're going to cross our outbound track from England, which means we will complete our loop around the world, completing our circumnavigation. When we set out from England on our 37 foot sailboat Florence, we had never lived on a boat. We had never crossed an ocean. We had never sailed overnight alone. We had a lot to learn. But we had a dream and a determination to succeed. So we're nearly there, we're nearly reached the point where we're going to actually cross over our track. It's just eight miles in front of us now and I don't know how are you feeling it's it's taken a while for it to kind of sink into me I don't really yeah same for me to be honest I think I guess it's just felt normal we've been approaching this milestone for a long time <laughs> and been really close for a long time and it wasn't until I started thinking back to what a big deal it was when we set, first set off and that it really hit home about what we're doing. It wasn't until this morning just after dawn I was sat on deck just thinking about this achievement in the context of actually sailing around the world and remembering back how we felt when we were passing down this coast of Grenada six years ago when actually we couldn't really comprehend sailing around the whole world at that point in time. We were, we were splitting it into chunks. It was sail from England to Panama and then work out how to sail from Panama to New Zealand. And at this point we were like, well, we'll work out the rest once we get to New Zealand. It takes a bit of mental adjustment to think back to how we used to feel about it. After now we sailed, you know, over 40,000 miles at sea and just taking the boat across an ocean feels almost normal. Yeah. And then you have to back away from that and go, that, that's not normal, most, most people don't do that. Back seven years ago, we did have normal lives. We woke up to an alarm in the morning, sat in traffic whilst commuting to full-time office jobs, ate our lunch at our desks, and then returned home to mow the lawn, eat dinner, and prepare for the next day at work. Exploring the world outside of work was limited to a couple of weeks holiday a year, travelling in Europe. Our passion was sailing. But this was limited to dinghy racing in evenings and at weekends. Our life was on track, our aim was to work hard, save hard, and then retire early. We had a distant dream of sailing around the world in retirement, but no set plan. Then, our normality was shattered. After 14 years working for the same company, in the same building, the business that Matt worked for shut their UK office. And his job no longer existed. Our life track was fractured. We suddenly needed to make big decisions. Did we try to return to our original track with a similar normality? Or was this our opportunity to go off-piste? What about that dream? The one where we sail around the world in our retirement on a 45-foot catamaran? Could we do it now, on a smaller boat, with a limited budget? Maybe. We would risk losing everything we had built, say goodbye to careers, to financial security, to the normality we knew. But then we thought about everything we had to gain, and the decision was made. Today we are going to see Florence, because we've just bought her. We just picked up the keys. Run about, take second legs towards lane. When we left the shores of England behind, the 380 mile crossing of Biscay 
was a hugely daunting prospect. Neither of us had sailed that far offshore before. It turned out to be a baptism of fire, with 35 knots of wind as we approached the Spanish coast. Arriving in Spain was a relief in so many ways. Not only had we survived our first offshore passage, but we now realised that the dream was really possible. We had crossed the first hurdle, we had set off, and we had the world ahead of us. Seeing an island appear on the horizon from a small boat in the middle of the ocean is incredibly exciting. Porto Santo and Madeira were the first of many, and our excitement on board Florence as we made our first island landfall after four days at sea was indescribable. From there the passage is built as we island hopped our way south down the Atlantic to the Cape Verde Islands, the jumping off point for our first ocean crossing. Our 14 day, 2000 mile Atlantic crossing was a mix of highs and lows. The euphoria of loving life at sea and catching a massive fish Look at this whopper. was balanced by the serious business of squalls, a broken spinnaker pole to fix and the most serious breakage of our entire circumnavigation so far. Last night we broke the boom, which is pretty major. After the squalls and damage at the end of the passage, it was a relief to arrive in the Caribbean. The delights of the balmy Caribbean were many to a pair of cold water sailors from England. This was our first winter summer. Cheers! Our first Christmas in short. Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas. Hey. The Caribbean is the most famous cruising ground in the world for a reason, and we could have spent years there. But the clock was ticking. When we set off from England, this trip was planned for three years. To keep to that schedule, we needed to sail halfway around the world to New Zealand in 18 months. So we left the carnivals behind and sailed west towards Panama, where we found our first taste of Paradise Islands. The idyllic palm tree studded islands of San Blas were just a taste of what was to come in the South Pacific. But first, we had to negotiate one of the seven wonders of the modern world, the Panama Canal. We gazed up in wonder at the gargantuan lock walls from the deck of Florence and felt very small as we transited through from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean. That's it, we're in the Pacific! <laughs> The Pacific Ocean is huge. Our first passage was 4,200 miles non-stop to the Marquesas in French Polynesia. That took us 33 days without sight of land. After all that time at sea, we were greeted by our first Pacific Island and one of the most spectacular anchorages in the world, Fatu Hiva. The culture, the people and the natural environment of the remote Pacific islands and atolls were exactly what our dreams were made of. Our senses were overwhelmed, our minds blown. We found it difficult to comprehend that we had actually sailed here and it was all really happening. If you'd asked us before we set off where in the world we were most excited to explore, our answer would have been the Pacific Islands. If you ask us again now, where we'd most like to return to, the answer is still the same.
we have promised ourselves that one day we will return to this remote paradise. But island hopping across 8,000 miles of the Pacific Ocean was not without its challenges. We had to learn to navigate by eye through narrow reef passages with strong currents and wildly inaccurate charts. We were very aware that should anything break or go wrong, there was no hope of rescue or spare parts in this incredibly remote part of the world. Arriving in New Zealand, having sailed halfway around the world, was exciting, but also a relief. Here we could get spare parts and fix all of the things that had broken when crossing the remote Pacific Islands. We had a lot of work to do and were exhausted from having spent the last 18 months constantly on the move. Yet here was also where our careful plan fell apart. We were simply having too much fun. We didn't want to skip through the rest of the world so quickly. We decided we could stretch our budget and threw away our three year plan so we could see more places as we voyaged on around the world. That was a very good decision as the amazing experiences kept on coming. In Vanuatu, we find ourselves standing on the rim of an active volcano. Before continuing on to Australia, where we sailed for thousands of miles and many months, cruising the East Coast. under the Sydney Harbour Bridge was one of the key top items we wanted to do when we set off on this round the world trip and we just done it. It's awesome! Leaving the Pacific behind we were sad as we thought the best part of our voyage was over. Don't cry. It's still an exciting life to go. It is. Maybe we'll come back one day. Mm. Maybe you'll grab the wheel and we'll turn left through the Panama Canal when we get to the Caribbean. <laughs> then we sailed into another world. As we dropped anchor in Indonesia, the sights, sounds and smells overwhelmed our senses. We sat in the cockpit of Florence struggling to take it all in. Bats flitted through the rigging as the call to prayer reverberated around the anchorage and the smell of spicy cooking wafted along the gentle breeze. We had joined an organised rally of yachts to sail through Indonesia and that turned out to be one of our best decisions. It led to some of the most memorable experiences of the trip. From racing war canoes in Bandanera <laughs> to racing water buffalo in Sambawa. It wasn't just the culture in Indonesia that blew our minds. The nature was equally stunning. We hung out with orangutans in Borneo. Stalked prehistoric dragons in Komodo. Swam with gigantic whale sharks and manta rays. And explored some of the world's most spectacular coral reefs. The people of Indonesia were amazing. One of the best things about travelling by boat is that when somebody shares their home with us, we can return the favour. Morning! Hello! <laughs> I'm a little scary, but it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so excited. Yes. 
So now you see the sail is just starting to fly. <laughs> <laughs> Captain! But now we were faced with the busiest shipping lane in the world, the Malacca Strait. Not just full of huge ships to dodge, but also unlit fishing boats and a never-ending procession of squalls and lightning storms. Sailing through the straits varied from scary to terrifying, and this is one of the few places in the world that we have no desire to return to. So this is the fun and games of sailing up the Malacca Straits at night. We've got a massive thunder and lightning storm just like burst right over us. Winds switch through 180 degrees. We've got fishing boats doing 180 degree turns around us. And you can barely see through the rain, it's just hammering down. The wind really picked up really quickly. It really doesn't help that our wind instruments are packed up as well, so we've got no wind direction other than looking up at the mast and you can't do that because your eyes get stuck by the rain. Yeah, last night I just wanted to give up. <laughs> I'd had enough. Thankfully, at the end of the straits lie the beautiful Thai islands, where we could relax and restock Florence, ready to cross the Indian Ocean. But then came Covid. Well that's a first for us, we've just been kicked out of the port of Sabang in Banda Aceh, Indonesia. We got passed by quarantine and we were allowed to spend almost a week enjoying ourselves there. And then suddenly everything changed with the global situation on the coronavirus and we were asked to leave. In fact, we're banned from the whole of Banda Ache. We're kind of stuck, we're kind of stateless. Where we go from here, we don't know. So yeah, it's a bit of a strange feeling really. With the world's borders closed, we found ourselves stuck on the edge of the Indian Ocean. Unable to get home and with nowhere else to go, for a month we were not allowed to stop in any port. We could not buy food, fuel or water, and anywhere we stopped we were told to leave immediately. It was a very scary time. But when looking for an uninhabited location to wait things out, we came across the most beautiful deserted island we have ever seen. We ended up staying in Indonesia for 14 months throughout the pandemic and it was a time of polarised feelings for us. The stress of not knowing each month if we'd be kicked out with nowhere to go and of trying to negotiate permission to stay. We've been told two diametrically opposed things. We're very, very stressed and we've no idea what, how we even resolve this situation. What a mess. What, what? That was balanced with the highs of finding unsailed cruising grounds, making new friends and learning to scuba dive and surf in one of the best places in the world to do both of those things. Fast forward a year and we were released into the Indian Ocean for our most challenging ocean crossing so far. We turned back once and faced squalls, no wind and lightning storms on our 3,044 mile, 23 day passage to Seychelles. The voyage was back on. That was the closest lightning strike I think we've ever had. Have we still got instruments? Seychelles was not all holiday though. After so long unable to perform maintenance in remote Indonesia, we had a stack of work to do. With osmosis on the rudder, a broken engine mount to fix and a battery bank to replace, we had a busy time in the yard.
Leaving Seychelles behind, we had to negotiate the notoriously difficult Mozambique Channel. We had been worried about sailing this passage ever since we started planning, even before we left England. Powerful ocean currents, combined with changeable winds, meant we were on the edge of our seats as each new weather forecast downloaded. But if we could plot our way through the hazards of this channel, our reward would be setting foot on yet another new continent for us. Arriving in Richards Bay, South Africa, we felt a heady mix of emotions. The relief of safe arrival after a hazardous passage, combined with our excitement to explore this new continent. We exchanged wide open seascapes for wide open landscapes. And wild weather for wild animals. South Africa did not disappoint. I hoped we'd get this close to elephants, but I didn't really think that we would. But this was just a pause as we waited a month for a weather window to sail around the most treacherous point on South Africa's coastline, the Cape of Storms. Propelled by the Agulhas current, we smashed Florence's 24-hour speed record as we sped down the wild coast towards the southernmost point of the African continent. We've done Cape Agulhas and now we've got the Cape of Good Hope, which is also known as the Cape of Storms. It looks like we're going to get a bit of a sting in the tail. We've got the wind is blowing straight up from the south, the southeast, off the Antarctic. It's fucking freezing. We are wearing all the clothes we have and uh, it looks like we're going to get blown past this cape pretty quickly. The coastline of South Africa has a fearsome reputation. Sailing around the notoriously stormy Cape of Good Hope is a serious undertaking. As we approached this famous cape, the winds built. We passed it in gale force winds under storm jib alone. is the one that we feared the most out of the passage and given its reputation and, and what we heard about it we thought this was going to be an awful part of the trip but it's actually the best bit it's the most fun arriving in the beautiful Hout Bay we paused for three months to reflect explore and perform a long list of maintenance, repairs and improvements to Florence. We still had two ocean crossings left between us and our home port. Not for us, the shorter route directly up the Atlantic. We would cross the South Atlantic to the Caribbean before returning across the North Atlantic to our starting point in England. As the weather became colder, we pointed our bow back towards the equator. Setting out from Cape Town with Florence in great condition, we sailed north up the cold and foggy Benguela current to Namibia. Namibia was our last stop on the African continent before we kicked off for 4,400 miles of open ocean sailing from Africa to South America. In the midst of the vast South Atlantic Ocean, 
we found the first of two tiny isolated islands on our route. After 10 days at sea, we shook some life back into our land legs as we explored the dramatic, rugged landscape of St Helena, a remote British territory hundreds of miles from anywhere. But all too soon, it was time to sail on. We headed back out to the empty horizons of the South Atlantic, in perfect trade wind conditions, and Florence made rapid progress, surfing the open ocean waves. Twelve days and 1,700 miles after we left St Helena, we spotted the tiny island of Fernando de Naranja, a Brazilian holiday island and a welcome pit stop for Florence. <laughs> we still had 1,300 miles left to sail to reach our destination on mainland South America. So after just four days exploring, we set sail again. From Fernando, we had a fast ride on the Guyana current, up and across the equator for the fourth time. Cheers, welcome to the Northern Hemisphere again. Cheers. South Atlantic has a reputation for being just calm, relatively easy sailing and it's definitely been our easiest crossing ever. It may have been easier than our previous crossings, but we still had work to do to repair Florence before we could explore this slice of South America. Sailing around the world is a real lesson in being self-sufficient and self-reliant. Exchanging salt water for fresh and a blue horizon for green and brown, we took Florence inland, up a river and into the jungle and witnessed the spectacular sight of a rocket being launched into space. I think that's a once in a lifetime opportunity and if you ever get the chance to be near a space centre, you should definitely see a launch. That just left the small matter of a 600 mile passage to get to the Caribbean, where we could cross our outbound track from England and complete our loop around the world. However, that would not be easy. We've been doing so much sailing recently that we kind of saw 600 miles as being this little tiny hop at the end of our Atlantic crossing to get to the Caribbean. Turns out, 600 miles is actually quite a long way. <laughs> Between French Guiana and the Caribbean, we hit the doldrums, which plagued us with light winds and squalls. The weather was not going to make it easy for us to become true sailing circumnavigators. But after spending six and a half years sailing Florence around the world, Neptune should have known that we are stubborn and will never give up. After 46,000 miles of sailing around the world, the Caribbean welcomed us with Carnival in Tobago. Now, just 75 miles later, we are approaching Grenada, and we have done it. Time for a champagne breakfast. In proper Florence style, even though we sailed the entire way around the world for this, uh, we couldn't bring ourselves to pay for proper champagne so we've got carver. Yeah, yeah I'm not quite sure how far we have to sell to justify proper champagne but uh, this are, is not it. <laughs> we are having it for breakfast so. So shake it up. No. To sail it around the world. Yeah. <laughs>
this morning I was feeling like what we're doing is just very normal. We live in this bubble where every, well, most of the people that we meet are, are sailing offshore and, and long distances and it just becomes the norm and it's just when you sit and process process it like we have done this morning um, that it, it's a reminder of how big, <laughs> how big this is and it's something that we've been working towards for seven years seven years since since you were made redundant and, and we started thinking about what, what on earth we were going to do next. Yeah, seven years ago somebody said you don't have a job anymore. Ten months later we had bought a boat, sold everything and left England. Yeah. It's amazing that you still can have adventures in this modern world. I mean you read all the adventure books as you're a kid and you're like oh yeah those big kind of adventures and then kind of get to adult life and those adventures don't really seem possible but oh, they are. They're out are. there. <laughs> they're out there. Man, this last six years has been an adventure, hasn't it? Massive adventure. <laughs> to me, the thing that really gives me tingles is when I think back over the journey and just how many amazing experiences we've had, the number of amazing people that we've met and countries that I didn't even know existed. I'm also really proud that it's been just the two of us sailing on yeah. Florence the entire way round. We've both done every leg together we've done pretty much all of the maintenance on Florence to get us round together all of the planning all of the dealing with customs immigration and all the paperwork mm -hmm. oh, the bureaucracy. <laughs> yeah which yeah. takes up quite a lot of time uh, but it also just shows that it is possible if there is something you really want to do sometimes it's a big thing leaving the UK this was a massive thing to say around the world and and stepping outside of what we're doing it is still a massive thing However, once you actually start doing it, you realise how much is actually possible if you're prepared to throw everything at it and, yeah, work hard at it. It's amazing what you can do. Now that we've closed our loop, you might be wondering what's next for us. Are we going to return to our old normality or are we forever changed? We'll share all of our future plans with you in the next episode. In the meantime, if you enjoyed this video, then please share it with all of your friends because that will help us to grow our audience and enable us to keep on making these videos. We found this video a really difficult task <laughs> to pack six and a half years of sailing around the world down into yeah. one short YouTube video. So if you'd like to see some more of the adventures behind the clips that we've shared here, then there's a playlist of over 140 videos that we shared from our voyage around the world, and there's a link to that playlist in the screen now. But although it's just been the two of us, both filming and sailing throughout this voyage, we have definitely not been alone. Our supporters and our patrons have been right there with us along the way and if it wasn't for them we would be returning back to the normality of the daily commute and our office jobs and this video would not even exist. So thank you very much to everybody that supported us.